Thank you very much, Nick. And I think uh, we have to look at the for water political issues from international, regional, and national perspectives. So there are some good international steps uh, over the political issues, uh, over the water security issues, like we can refer to the Rio summit, we can re refer to the all the summit which have United Nations climate change framework, and also refer to the Hugo framework of action from international perspectives. Some of these water-related uh, issues included first time in risk reduction effort, that is Hugo framework of action. And Hugo framework of action is giving uh, emphasis from international perspective, that is the gender dimension, bringing first time when we are getting reports from the different nations, we find that this is not integrated in the international perspective. And another is, uh, if there are many theories that conflicts over hydroclimatical issues, which should be given um, perspective, much more emphasis from the international perspectives. And uh, uh, from conflict, and the other one is the collaboration perspective. So there are uh, theories on collaboration over regional water issues, mainly because, uh, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, we are located in the lower stream, uh, within the South Asian region, and three major rivers origin outside Bangladesh, but, but confluencing within Bangladesh. So if anything happened in the upper stream areas is affecting uh, Bangladesh. So there are some issues which we call bilateral issues, which are not discussed properly within the regional perspective. So that is, uh, collaboration is there, but some of the bilateral issues which we are not discussing properly, and that is our one, one of the framework, that is CERC framework for risk reduction, that is not followed properly. But we follow the United Nations climate change uh, framework on uh, their water is a main, main, much more emphasized issue. And another is national perspective, that water issues are often underestimated by the national policy making levels, and it is often uh, looked at uh, the one uh, single agenda, like water policy, like uh, water-related uh, laws or legal issues, but it is not a cross-cutting. So it is, uh, if we would like to uh, link it with health, with agriculture, with food security issues, and with education even, water is much more important in the national level. And another issue from, like we look at the equitable issues, but we have to look at the equality issues. Because equity is the legislative framework, uh, inclusive perspectives we are not giving here, like access to water to the uh, women, children, men, as well as uh, to the persons with disability, and those are differently able people. So the equitable access should be inclusive, which is sometimes overlooked. Sometimes international level, the military actions which are uh, shaping, uh, which are taking place, like you can remember about the Butros Butros Gali's comment that the next world war will be happening, occurring, uh, related based on water, but which we have not seen yet properly. Uh, but we can see that there are some military actions and also the manipulation of water allocation. That is regional, international, as well as national perspective. So if we look at the, uh, look at the equitable or equality issues, then more focus for equality issues will be national level, but equity issues from the international, national, and regional level, which are the, which are the uh, law or legal framework giving, taking some affirmative actions towards equality. So be it gender, be it other uh, kind of uh, equality we are thinking. So equitable access, efficient use, uh, and availability of water of quality and quantity. That is important for both, for all these national, international, and regional level. So I should stop here. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we're now going to go to our second speaker. I should say we're gonna allow all the speakers to speak first, and then we'll come to the more interactive Q&A. Uh, so Louise, would you like to take Great. us on? Thanks very much. <clears throat> um, so my name is Louise Bloom and I work in the Refugee Studies Centre here at Oxford. Um, so I wanted to draw on um, the refugee perspective perhaps um, on this idea of accountability and in relation to water governance. Um, 
So in our project, we've been looking at what innovation means in um, refugee issues and how refugees' own ingenuity are linked to both the kind of national and international um, community perspective of changes that need to happen and innovation that happens. Um, so I just wanted to quickly look at what accountability means in a refugee perspective and then think about some um, alternatives to political accountability that we've seen in our research and then really briefly touch on um, some ideas for kind of overcoming some of the challenges that are faced in refugee um, context. So maybe just to start, for those of you who might not be completely familiar with refugee issues, um, I wanted to just give the definition of a refugee. So a refugee is someone that um, has fled persecution and crossed over a border to seek protection. Um, so often people that are affected by either um, disasters or crisis and um, conflict, as we've seen in the Syria um, situation in the media in the last five years. Um, so worldwide there are now 60 million people who are forcibly displaced, so that includes not only refugees but internally displaced people, so affected by disaster response. And this is a number that's bigger than we've seen since World War II. So around 15 million of those are actually refugees the size of you know, a small country, so not an insignificant number of people. Um, and when refugees cross borders, um, often the host countries um, resort to using refugee camps to house large influxes of people. Um, so it's estimated that about a third of these um, 15 million refugees um, are kind of placed in camps. And often these refugee camps have been equated to prison-like situations, prison camps if you like. Um, we were recently in Jordan this year and we heard lots of accounts from Syrian refugees who had said, you know, they'd been forced to go back, to, you know, sent to the camp after actually residing in the rural or urban areas if they'd been found to, you know, be working or doing something wrong outside of um, the camp um, and they have to get permission to leave the camp and obviously in terms of the government perspective often that's um, <coughs> kind of said that it's a, a form of protection for refugees that you know if they have permission to leave the camp then they're you know more protected the um, state knows where they are um, but what I found really interesting when thinking about this question about accountability is that for refugees, especially in those camp contexts, it's not actually the host government that has the sole responsibility, if you like, or is accountable for providing public services such as water. It actually lies on the international community as well. So often in refugee camps, the responsibility to run and operate the camp goes to the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR. Um, and they have funding and have implementing partners such as Oxfam um, and lots of other NGOs who then are really the sole um, responsible parties, if you like, for delivering water services and other services, public services in the camp. And so the issue of accountability I kind of saw as, you know, it's, it's, it's diluted or divided between those two um, different actors. So the host government on one hand and the international community on the other. Um, and I think this is challenging for, for two reasons when we look at those two. So um, in terms of the host country government, often we find that in terms of their perspective and um, accountability for refugees at large, um, it's often that refugees are seen as a temporary um, population in their country. They're really treated with short-term um, effects not included at all in national reports. Um, I re I, when I was preparing for this, I read the, um, or had a quick look at the Uganda National Water Report <coughs> planning, and there was, I just did a quick search for the word refugee, it's not mentioned at all. Um, and actually Uganda is host to over 600,000 refugees. So it's not um, an insignificant group of population, but um, as the REACH project is looking at um, this invisible poor group, I kind of would think of refugees as this invisible poor who are kind of often neglected by um, state perspectives and planning. Um, and then when we think about the international community, again, um, refugee camps um, are often treated with emergency humanitarian aid, which is often, of course, needed and required in the first instances when refugees come um, into camps. But in fact, in Kenya, the two main camps, Kukuma and Dadab, um, they're both, um, they've both been ex in existence for over 20 years, um, and the average time someone spends as a refugee globally is 17 years. Um, so it's not that refugees are really temporary, um, if you like. And so there's a bit of a um, kind of contradiction or tension, if you like, between thinking about refugees as an emergency response humanitarian problem versus a development problem. So on the one hand, they're not connected to development plans by the country, and they're treated with um, emergency response, which leaves them in this kind of limbo, if you like, it's been mentioned. 
And this um, humanitarian development divide is something that has been um, on the agenda for especially the World Bank, but also some other scholars in our department. So Roger Zetter and Alexander Betts have both written on this issue that humanitarian development divide is an issue that in a, at a policy level has been discussed as a problem for refugees specifically, um, <clears throat> but not, there hasn't been really any kind of solutions out of it as such yet. Um, so if we think about the responsibility to provide public services, so going to water, um, when we look at a refugee camp, that some of the challenges that come up are, um, so NGOs, if they're the ones that are responsible, the funding is often short term, they can't, are not able to um, engage in long-term planning. Um, if the governments don't have this long-term development perspective or accountability for refugees and therefore don't necessarily engage with NGOs in long-term planning or take refugee camps into consideration for the wider um, kind of water strategies for the country. Um, but internally and more a kind of more micro level and operationally within the camps, and, and you'll probably be able to speak more to this, there are other challenges. There's, there is a fluidity of the geography, if you like. Um, uh, myself and my colleague Nina, when we were in Zatari refugee camp in the northern northern Jordan, which is now host to about 80,000 refugees, um, Syrian refugees, people were moving their houses, the kind of caravans that had been distributed around the camp, which made it very difficult to plan for water services and sanitation services in the camp. And so there's this tension in that sense with you know the communities leading and wanting to construct, reconstruct in some cases their own um, you know community spaces, um, and then it being um, kind of controlled or you know starting from scratch these public services that. You know, weren't there from the government to start with, and Satari in this case, it was you know just a, a complete desert and opened in 2012 and started from scratch, really kind of like a, a town or urban environment starting from scratch. So you're obviously going to get some of these tensions at the beginning. Um, then you get um, issues of inequality of distribution. That so um, water storage tanks are provided in lots of ta um, um, camps or even boreholes. So lots of boreholes are maintained, created and maintained by NGOs and the UNHCR. Um, and they often don't necessarily control the distribution, so people will queue up um, and take the water. And that um, obviously people with more power in the community might abuse some of those issues. And that was certainly the case in Jordan for electric electricity. So electrical wires were brought into the camp, but people would, you know, take off them and overuse it such that there's a massive bill for UNHCR to pay, and they couldn't pay them anymore or maintain it. And so now there is no electricity, and people have resorted back to using generators. Um, so this kind of long-term maintenance and you know distribution tracking is again difficult when you're starting from scratch. Um, long-term funding isn't there, and then um, another thing we've been interested in in, in our research is um, not only this perspective of governments, governments and international community of thinking of refugees as temporary, but actually lots of refugees also want to go home again and don't necessarily see themselves as permanent citizens in that country. So again, drawing on um, our research in Jordan, we met lots of Syrian refugees who said, you know, when we first arrived, we thought we'd only be here for 10 days. And we were meeting them three, four years after they'd arrived in Zetar and had to spend that prolonged period of time in the camp. And it's not looking like necessarily they'll be able to go home anytime soon. So this short-term perspective, even from a refu refugee themselves, um, I think adds to this problem of, you know, the tragedy of the commons, that um, if they think they're only there short term, they're not necessarily going to want to maintain their land or um, respect the public services that they're provided. They'd have no incentive, and if they're not treated with the kind of the rights as a long-term citizen, then why should they kind of treat their environment as such? Um, and so in lots of cases, lots of countries, um, refugees don't have full access to public services, whether it's education, health, um, or the right to work. Um, so this varies depending on by country by country, but it, this again is another kind of massive division between how refugees are able to access what exists in a country and what national systems are already there. Um, so then I kind of just wanted to really quickly draw on this idea of, you know, the first question we said, is pol political accountability ne really necessary mm. for equitable water access? So I think it is, pol the political aspect is really important for refugees because um, fundamentally being a refugee, it's a legal status, you're a human being, but you're under a different regulatory environment, if you like, compared to the citizens of that country. <coughs> so the pol policy politics is important and you 
uh, you know, the rights to have the right to work um, is essential and there is an advocacy that goes with trying to allow refugees better rights. Um, but we, from our research, have seen alternative coping mechanisms, if you like. And so kind of seen three different things. So the first is um, these kind of like complementary community um, led initiatives which go on top of the services that are provided by NGOs. So what I mean by that is um, where there are boreholes, for example, provided by um, the UN, um, lots of refugees, you know, leverage off the existence of that borehole to then create an income for themselves, um, use that water for well, not only their household but also livelihoods. And so in Nakivali refugee settlement, which is in the south of Uganda, where we spent quite a lot of time doing our research, it's the oldest refugee camp in Africa. It was built in 1959. So just to give you a kind of perspective, it's very much kind of um, rural settlement in that sense. Um, but we found that lots of refugees would kind of leverage off these services that were given to um, create an income. So they would they were either employed as pump assistants to maintain those pumps, um, but more interestingly, they would also make money by um, providing a delivery service from the boreholes to other refugee houses. And so there's very much a kind of water economy, if you like, around these structures that were provided to them. Um, and then the second um, alternative perspective is um, private sector um, initiatives. So from the local host government, uh, probably sorry, local host community, private initiatives. So in Zatari refugee camp back in Jordan, um, we met a Jordanian company who were allowed, who had got permission to be inside the camp to do um, reverse osmosis water purification in the camp for drinking water. And so this was like an additional service um, that was kind of working in complementarity to the um, water that was provided by the UN. Um, and then alternative mechanisms as well. We also met lot, have met lots of refugees Again, in, um, in our work in Uganda, there was one guy we met who needed water to cool his generator for his um, milling plant. Um, so he would often get water from the lake and pay people to come bring him water from the lake. Um, but he managed to save enough money to build a ferrous amount water tank to collect rainwater. Um, so he did that and he was able to cool his, water, his um, generators um, more easily and ch cheaper, um, in effect. Um, with that, but he had so he managed to collect so much water during the rainy season that actually he um, subsidised. He was able to kind of substitute um, the water to the, his local village, so people would come and buy water from him from his tank when the boreholes ran dry or the boreholes weren't actually maintained um, by the NGOs. So I think those kind of there are alternative mm. mechanisms that exist, and that there's not necessarily a connection between these kind of like macro level plans and policy level with the micro kind of happenings, if you like, in these water economies that exist at, in refugee camps. Um, and so I think this was mentioned in the previous section, but of course the accountability lies across lots of different actors, and I think even more so in a refugee context. So not only are refugees kind of doing things within their water, with their water economy, um, there, there's not, there, is a, there is a connection with refugees and the host community, often, um, especially in Uganda, lots of Ugandans lived sort of on the peripherals or on, on, in the settlement camps themselves and would kind of share resources or provide resources to each other. Um, and then the, obviously the local governments, the international community, NGOs, UN, and the national um, government as well. So I think the accountability really runs across a kind of plethora of um, actors. And so I had just three brief comments to close up um, to think about what changes are required to get over some of these challenges t at tackling kind of water provision, if you like, or even public services to refugees. So the first is um, having a better consideration of this long-term services and you know needs for refugees that not treating them as um, kind of short-term temporary um, populations which of course has been the arguments been made elsewhere but is also important for um, water services um, the second would be to leverage the innovative solutions by refugees and the local host communities and businesses so making that connection between the micro and macro um, again um, and yeah, and my third point was kind of having a, this more connected perspective um, and whether actually NGOs are in a very good position to do that because they, um, you know, are able to advocate and connect the refugee voices, if you like, and the local community perspective with that government and that um, I'm kind of interested in our future research going forward with REACH to see how connected or disconnected those pieces are and what um, kind of blockages exist. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you too also for being present for this session.
My understanding of uh, the task here is to look at uh, political accountability in the context of fragile states and uh, you know, uh, the implications of that for water security. And in dealing with this question, I think I'll, I'll try and draw on some of the experiences that uh, we have had uh, in Kenya. Uh, the, the basic, uh, I think, approach uh, would be to, to try and address this in, in three contexts. Uh, one is uh, really to look at you know, uh, the kind of pillars that one would use uh, in um, dealing with the political accountability, uh, and then uh, look at um, you know, how you strengthen political accountability and uh, you know, the way in which, in which one goes about it. My, my view is this, that uh, in order to, that political accountability is essential. And uh, to achieve it, uh, one needs to, to do two things and uh, to do them simultaneously. One is to strengthen institutions uh, and two is to empower people. Uh, and I think that both of those uh, must be undertaken simultaneously. Uh, the, you know, way in which one would secure water security uh, depends very much on the approach that is used to strengthen institutions and empower people. And uh, the extent to which uh, I think that has been tried in Kenya, I think, is, is uh, in my view, the example. Uh, of, of how one can deal with this question of political accountability uh, within the context of fragile states. I take the view that you know, all states are to some extent uh, fragile, it depends very much on context. In terms of strengthening institutions, uh, essentially my, my view is that uh, the way you enhance water security is by having institutions that have the capacity to deliver on their mandate. Uh, so uh, this insecurity, uh, water insecurity, insecurity in other contexts arises because institutions are weak and cannot deliver on their mandate effectively. So my first approach would be you must strengthen institutions. So if you take this in a water context, if you have uh, entities whose mandate it is to deliver water, they must have the capacity uh, to deliver water financially, uh, technically, administration, management, they must have that capacity. Uh, if you take institutions whose mandate it is to regulate and manage water resources, they must have the capacity to issue permits, they must have capacity to enforce the conditions of that permit, of the permits, and they must have the capacity to take decisions and resist pressure from vested interests. So for me, institutional strengthening is the first entry point. Institutional strengthening must go hand in hand with empowering of people. The reason being that, uh, and I think it is self-evident, that the stronger institutions are, the bigger the risk that they will become unaccountable. They become unaccountable because now they have the capacity to deliver and they begin to assume that they know the way in which uh, this should be done. So empowering people, in my view, is essential to counterbalance on the need and the necessity, in my view, for strong institutions. You empower people uh, through what, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so my perspective on this is, is dominated by the, the belief that you must give people rights, the rights to demand uh, you know, what their right is, you must specify what those rights are, and you must create uh, stakeholder groups that enable people to assert those rights. So I think that a rights-based approach is critical in empowering people, and in Kenya that has been pursued through uh, constitutional rights, for instance, the right to water, but also through rights such as the right of access to information and to judicial intervention. So for instance, what has happened in Kenya is that we've opened up the possibility of going to court to anybody without having to demonstrate that you personally are affected. So we have very many constitutional petitions that are attempting to assert rights against uh, you know, public institutions whose mandate it is to deliver water. So this combination of strong institutions and an empowered population uh, who have access to judicial remedies, have access to information, in my view, 
enhances political accountability. I think uh, one has then to address some of the challenges that arise in the kinds, in the methodologies that we use uh, to achieve these twin uh, objectives of stronger institutions and an empowered population. There are very many situations, and one of the questions I think that was raised in the context of this panel is how external intervention uh, affects or nuances uh, the approaches that we use. And I, I'd like just to speak to that. There are very many situations in which the approaches that we use in empowering institutions actually end up undermining those institutions. I'll give you an example, uh, not, drawn, not in the water sector at all, but I happen to be at the University of Nairobi. DFID happens to be financing this particular project, so I think an example of this DFID's policies would be good. Uh, at the University of Nairobi, University of Nairobi is an institution, in my view, that requires strengthening in order to deliver on its mandate. One of the areas in which it requires strengthening is in its capacity to carry out research. Because of this DFID's doubts or concerns about its legitimacy, uh, as an institution, DFID adopts a policy, and many other donor organizations have done that. I'm just using DFID because of the context. That, in fact, they will give research grants to non-governmental organizations rather than through the University of Nairobi. When you do that, then us academics who work at the University of Nairobi begin to ally ourselves with non-governmental organizations. So we spend our time, we spend our capacity working outside of the university. So the university now becomes weaker because its resources are diverted to where the money is. But to convince external interveners, such as donor organizations and so on, that look, put your money through the university in order to empower this institution is a very hard sell. Now, I use that to illustrate the point that even in the context of water security, unless you're willing to work with the government institutions, the water service providers, the county governments, the Water Resources Management Authority, then those institutions will be weak and they will not be able to deliver on their mandate. I know there is often a temptation to say non-governmental organizations are the answer. But my view is a strong state is much better able to deliver on water security than a weak state. So that is my first point on that. Now, the second point I want to, to make relates to this question of an empowered population. The approach that is used uh, conventionally in, in constitutions worldwide is to give rights to the public. Now, in my view, the public is a faceless entity that uh, often provides a mask for people who have vested interests to pursue those vested interests under the guise of pursuing human rights. And I would like to give you an example just uh, so that my, my point can be clear. Uh, and this one I will draw from, from the context of, of disputes over access to water in Kenya. We have, uh, this, this time in, in the east, uh, in, a, in a certain basin called Ewasonyiro, uh, as is the case in, in many places in Kenya, water is concentrated in the middle part of the country, which is where the catchments are, and then it flows down. In this case, the water flows from the eastern uh, side of Mount Kenya, down towards the Siolo, which is on the eastern part of the country, a very, very arid place. The Siolo town happens to be one of those places where there is no water. It's a semi-arid town and, and they have no drinking water. So African Development Bank uh, fin is, is puts together financing to build a dam, a reservoir, to divert water from you know, the upper reaches of Mount Kenya for domestic consumption down to Isiolo. The project is stuck in court for four years. Why? Because the people who are in the upper reaches, there is an ethnic dimension, they are Merus, the Isiolo people are Somali. They are farmers, they use the water for irrigation. They have no intention of allowing the water to go down to people 
who, who would use it for domestic consumption. Why? Because they have farming interests. But the crux of my point is this. They are a well-off rural community able to sustain court cases for four years using exactly the constitutional rights that we have given to anybody to go to court. Now, on balance, one would want to open up access to, to court and access to ventilate one's grievances. But one can see that when you do not nuance this and appreciate that empowering people must also take account of the potential for misuse of those remedies, then you actually end up creating further insecurity. It is for this reason that, in my view, as you go about empowering people, one must also reserve uh, for the government, reserve for institutions, what in Kenya we are calling the residual power to intervene. In the sense that you say that at some stage, there must be a public interest that overrides the camouflaged uh, you know, individual interests, as is the case in this particular situation. Now, when you do that, of course, there is the risk that you again use public institutions in a way that makes them unaccountable. So we are experiencing a paradox. That paradox basically is, is one that means that in designing institutions, one must be careful that you are always forced to balance. Uh, you must design institutions with a certain element of skepticism about motivations, about the risk that institutions will be subverted actually to, to serve interests that are you know, initially uh, not the interests that were intended when these institutions and remedies were being created. I want to give you one, one other example and then I will stop. Uh, we have in Kenya uh, been uh, pursuing an idea that uh, essentially in order to enhance water security for, for the poor, you must design institutions to have what is called a pro-poor agenda. Uh, and, and therefore, in the context of financing of, of extension of infrastructure for water services, uh, we have created uh, a water services trust fund. The, the mandate of the Water Services Trust Fund is to finance, and to, you know, to finance the extension of water services in areas that are underserved on account of the fact that they are too poor to be financially viable for a water company to, to, to provide water services there. Uh, initially, it looks like a good idea. However, what in my view it also does is to reinforce this idea that, that poor people have a certain special window to which they go cup in hand and then they are helped. Unfortunately, uh, in my view, when, when you do that, then you undermine the concept of water being a right to poor and rich alike. Okay, you give poor people the idea that in your case go to that window, everybody else who can afford to pay will get their water services through the water company. Uh, for poor people, there is a pro poor uh, framework that you, you adopt. For this reason, I think that in, in fashioning institutions and responses in order to address uh, the marginalized, we must also endeavor not to isolate the issue so that it is addressed in the context of some dedicated entities whose, whose uh, main approach is a charity one, not, not a right-based one. So those are my three points. Uh, I believe very much that political accountability uh, balanced with empowerment and fashioned through this kind of methodology that doesn't assume that you know, uh, marginalized groups can somehow be dealt with as an isolated entity, that if one can try and keep those three all in, in context, then I think we would have a way forward on this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last but certainly not least, Andy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I've got three points to make on the accountability issue. Um, the first one is to address accountability for who specifically? And so looking at um, the numbers 
Um, so Louise mentioned that 60 million um, refugees and IDPs are currently displaced. Um, but you've got 863 million slum dwellers and getting more every day. And um, you know, with the, um, the um, urban migration, this is set to rise hugely. And in the humanitarian sector, you have so many standards. You have the, the, the common humanitarian, uh, sorry, core humanitarian standards. You have sphere. You have all sorts of um, gender guidelines that, um, uh, you, you know, like ECHO, it was mentioned in the last session about um, some of the donors um, sort of making it a regulatory thing. You don't get ECHO money unless you kind of um, go through the, um, the gender um, standards. You have to fulfill those. So um, while the situation is far from perfect at all, and you've got some massive abuses on um, camps, you got IDP camps in um, <coughs> DRC, where the proportion of women that have been raped is absolutely just astronomical. Um, off, you know, it's just so distressing. So you've still got that going on. But actually, in the regulatory environment, um, they have 20 times as many sort of standards and regulations that agencies um, are trying to fulfill. And governments, there's many governments that have taken on sphere as a thing, and they kind of had been through all the sphere workshops. And sometimes they talk about it and actually say we should be meeting sphere indicators. But in slums, is there anything? Are there any, any standards like that at all? And governments would answer, well, they're illegal. You know, you get your legal, illegal slums. Um, and you think, well, who suffers from this? You know, that you get many um, slum situations where mafias kind of, kind of control things in the slums. Um, who suffers? Well, mostly the, the women. Um, so that's kind of the, the first point around that. And you think, um, what happens in these slums? I mean, you mentioned it slightly around um, kind of the, the wa informal water sector. So if you're in your average um, uh, African city, then you're, if you're on the piped water supply, your water is five times to ten times as cheap, sorry, cheaper than the people in many of the slums who are buying their water from water vendors. Um, that seems so, so wrong. Then you get the quality of that water, these kind of people with a donkey and a few jerry cans or a bicycle and a few jerry cans, and you're looking at these dirty jerry cans supplying water, even if it was clean at the source, which in many cases it's not. It's not clean by the time it gets to people. Um, and they pay ten times as much for it. Um, you know, it seems outrageous, um, actually. Um, I mean, it's all very difficult. I mean, it, it, Oxfam had a project in Bogota trying to improve the slums there, and then people would say, ooh, if kind of you improve our water and sanitation facilities, then our landlords will up the rent. So we'd rather you don't improve anything. Yeah? And then when you're arguing with governments in certain countries, some of those ministers and some of those governments, they own the land that kind of got these illegal um, slum settlements on. So they're not actually wanting to change the status quo at all. So it's you know, very easy for me to sit here and say, oh, we need to change the regulatory um, uh, kind of format process on this, I totally acknowledge it's very difficult. I think one where it's more tangible and achievable is actually changing regulations around water vendors. So these water vendors, whether it's a, a tanker or it's a um, person just carrying, carrying these kind of water containers, um, to, enable, to ensure that there is sort of kind of water quality checking going on. That seems to be more achievable than changing the legal environment of slums. So it's one step at a time. Um, and, and, you know, back to the refugee sort of thing, you think, well, um, Louise mentioned Zatry camp. So in Zatry, 
they get um, water seven days a week. The people in the kind of the suburbs in Amman get water twice twice a week. Yeah, so um, there's often, I mean, that's quite a stark one, but it's quite often there's the, the host community versus the refugees. And we all think, all right, the refugees, they come across traumatised um, from what they're fleeing from, mostly violence. Um, and therefore, they might have walked four days to get to a camp, and therefore they need higher... Um, this is how we've always argued it in Sphere. You need higher um, indicators for kind of health and, and um, water and sanitation provision um, because they're more vulnerable. And if they get kind of some disease, then it spreads like wildfire in a camp situation. Well, is that different to a slum? Certainly not. Um, and people are sort of malnourished in slums, making them equally vulnerable. So that first point is really about... Um, you know, where our, you know, there's been so much attention with the cluster system as well. Very successful, actually, at reinforcing standards um, for refugees um, and other standards for IDPs. That's good. Um, that actually, kind of, from observing, I, I sort of see, well, actually, that's good, but now we have to put our concentration on people who are in often much, much more terrible situations. Um, than a refugee camp, which you could argue so many refugee camps do become a slum. But I think they're better if you walk around your average long-term refugee camp, they're much better provisioned than walking around a slum, an urban slum in so many cities. Um, the other one is kind of related um, on the accountability side is um, the non-revenue water business this kind of statistic that um, between 30 and 40 percent of all um, water, there's water companies, water authorities across Africa, um, they're not getting revenue for 30 to 40 percent of the water. Why? I mean, I mean, sometimes it's inability to collect it, but so much of the time it's illegal taps into the water. Why? What would stop this? You know, in, in, um, in uh, I think in Jordan, it's 50%. So, you know, they're losing 50% on, on, on their production of water. Um, so how is that sustainable? And then you sort of get into conversations with various ministers and you realise that, um, you know, to actually crack down, for the government in so many cities across the world to crack down on this, because so many people aren't paying for their water, then it becomes a political issue. So if you want to be voted in next time, if you've had a hard policy um, with people who have made their illegal taps, then you probably won't be in power next. So it's the political hot potato, which is why it's still a big issue. If it was easy, it would have been solved. Um, but that one on the accountability, the regulatory environment, seems like a, a huge one that's not being addressed. You know, Oxfam, we get asked, oh, can, we, can we sort of increase the water supply in various <coughs> suburbs and things like this? And think, well, actually, the, the problem is a regulatory one. It's not about putting in new pipes and find, you know, dig, uh, drilling new boreholes. Um, okay, so the third point, um, water committees. So NGOs throughout time have... Well, actually, no. Okay, so maybe 30 years ago it all started, right? Every time you do a water point, um, uh, you ha have to have your water, co water committee. And these days, it's definitely kind of over you know, 50 or 60% kind of women on the, the water committee. Great. Um, and then all the research. So Richard Carter, when he was at Cranfield, did some research on it. I have a, a professor at Birmingham University just had a good report on it, conf confirming it. It was nice when and have your own views confirmed through 30 years of trotting around. My conclusion also is um, that water committees, village water committees, don't work. It doesn't take much time for either the treasurer to go off somewhere, um, the tools go off somewhere, people move, um, just over time people lose interest, or the big one actually managing to collect money for uh, kind of ongoing maintenance or repair. So um, 
I think there's you know evidence, not enough, I would say, a body of evidence that they didn't work. But um, I agree with the evidence I've seen of it kind of not working. And then you think, well, what, what's necessary? Um, in my view, kind of um, having water committees with no accountability is a recipe for disaster. So there has to be some kind of um, accountability. So whether that's the, the head person in a rural situation in the village, whether that's the local water authority have an overseeing. And um, in Kenya, in Turkana, um, Oxfam had a go at this model and the water committees that we set up, some of them have become like quasi water authorities, sort of the, the water authority, the central administrative body does consult with and treat them like a water authority. They're not, but they collect money, they, they have a kiosk, they collect money for their water, they maintain the water system, and now they've been, and it's mostly women that are being kind of consulted as part of the whole district's kind of water um, sources um, platform. Um, so the other thing about water committees is you know, it's all the NGOs trying to find who could do it, who are the, the leaders, the movers and shakers in a community and picking on the same sort of people. And then over time, those people, some strong women, uh, they become mistrusted by the community. You know, the it just reinforces this kind of maybe false hierarchy in the village system. And then they have the same problem that um, water authorities have, lack of trust. If you don't trust them, you try and not pay. Get around the system in whatever way. Um, so you think, okay, this is another one of these ones where um, it's easy to criticise what's the solution. So um, around the accountability business, um, definitely saying that all these water committees have to be accountable. The ideal situation was that, is that um, rural kind of authorities take charge. Um, kind of, but that's easier said than done. All over Africa there's less and less money available for your rural, rural water authority to get out and kind of play this role, um, so they can't. Um, and then you've got the uh, private sector model that you do have water committees that collect enough money to have a, a one kind of village level mechanic that go trotting around to different places. So these days you've got um, so much beautiful um, data collection um, uh, technologies for um, hand pumps that may not work. Or you've got Wagtech and um, Delagua both having now new systems where they can electronically shoot the, the water data and quality to a central place. You think, great, we're all better at collecting data. That's what's happened in the last 20 years. Great. But has that led to an increase in action? Um, not always. It's great to have the data. We need the data. So I'm not slagging off the data collectors. I'm just saying there hasn't been an equal um, amount of attention on once you've got the data, then what action do you take? You know, so an example of, you know, we all know that 30-40% um, of all rural hand pumps are dysfunctional at any time. Yeah, you just take Africa. You know that. So ah, now we've got all these new sexy ways of collecting the data with data loggers and all sorts of good things. But do we have money being put into sustainable ways of, you could say, not have any of that, you could say, uh, and just use all that money to pay for a regular service provider to go on a regular visit to all the hand, hand pumps in a certain area and, it, and fix them? Because you know for certain that a certain quantity will be um, broken. You know, I mean, that's, you know, maybe that's a bit silly to suggest that, but it's kind of, that's what we're seeing, a digital sort of bubble that's feeding itself and not an action-based kind of bubble that kind of actually encourages somehow. So on the accountability sort of side, to kind of say that any of these kind of new digital platforms for kind of, you've got a lovely um, drought alert um, platforms in Kenya as well, um, and various other sort of models. And how, you know, is, is there enough attention being put on or kind of a political process to say, right, you've got the data, now you must do something about it within X amount of time or 
questions will be asked, sort of thing. That's my comments. Thank you very much. Okay, we're getting to the point where we need to start the Q&A to make sure you all have lots of time to ask questions. So what I'll do is I'll throw out some questions that I think the speakers' different comments connect to, and then we'll come to you guys to ask questions before we come back to the audience. Otherwise, there's a danger we won't let you get your questions in. I think there's a number of really interesting questions here. I mean, one is about you know, linking technology with accountability and outcomes, which is your kind of final point. How do we actually make sure that technology plus data doesn't just equal lots of great data and nice articles and no actual progress on the ground? So if anyone out there has good positive examples of using technology to increase access and getting pumps to work, put your hand up and ask us a question. There's also obviously a very good kind of tension, productive tension here between Prof, your focus on rights and rights-based approaches and, and Louise, your comments about, in a sense, the lack of rights held by refugee communities who aren't treated in the same way as citizens by host governments and the complex legal status they're in. Um, and I think that, that raises an interesting question, which is what do, we, what do we do when we have communities for whom it's difficult to give rights um, in different ways? Well, what's the way that we actually treat, treat those communities? Um, Louise, I, also, I was also interested if you could say anything about the actual organisation of refugee camps themselves. You know, some refugee camps, we see that there are elections for leaders within the refugee camp context, and whether or not that kind of localised accountability as flawed and problematic as it often is, creates opportunities for actual mobilisation around issues like water. Um, and obviously one of the things that we, we then were talking about connecting um, the first and, and last speaker was around the issue of, of gender and what happens around water committees and whether or not there are ways of preventing these women from becoming seen as being suspicious by the community because of the power that you're giving them. And I think that it speaks to a comment that Prof also made about diffid and the unintended consequences of interventions. That if you go in and you empower people who you think are previously marginalised, that's great, but over time you may make them into new elites, new hierarchies, which either may create new distortions or may put them in a very difficult position versus their community. And of course, in terms of taking something proactive, positive forward from this session, it would be good to think about ways of ensuring that that doesn't happen.